Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Welcome to the Scientific Publishing Webinar hosted by the American Dairy Science Association, or ADSA. I'm Jess Townsend with ADSA Communications, and I'm going to get us started with a few welcome and housekeeping items before turning the event over to our host today, Dr. Paul Kononoff, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Dairy Science. As you settle in, we wanted to highlight that you can learn more about ADSA's publications on our website, including details on the Journal of Dairy Science and JDS Communications, our two journals. I'm going to get us started with a couple of quick warm-up questions. All right. First, we'd love to know where you're dialing in from today. Drop your location in the chat box so we can see the diverse group that we have in attendance. Mexico, Germany, Glasgow, amazing, <laughs> so fast, you guys are great. Puerto Rico, lots of Germany in the house, it looks like, amazing. New Hampshire, Iran, Lithuania, what a group. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Keep those questions coming or keep those responses coming and I'll go ahead and move us to the next question as well. All right, what temperature is it for everyone where you are? Drop your responses again in the chat. It's pretty cold here in Colorado, which is where I'm at. And there's quite a bit of snow on the ground, so I wanna live vicariously through warmer climates. 64 degrees I see, yes. 36, nice. 65 degrees, nice. Okay, this is what I needed. I need to live vicariously through warmer climates. This is great. <laughs> Keep those answers coming. All right. No pressure. Whenever you have a chance, go ahead and respond. But otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and get us started into the actual programming that we have for you all today. Quick reminder, you can always use the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will answer those questions for you at the end of today's programming. Um, again, thank you for all those responses. Now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Dr. Paul Kononoff, who's the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Dairy Science. Welcome and go ahead and take it away. Hello, my name is Paul Kononoff and the title of my talk today is Scientific Publishing, Choosing a Peer-Reviewed Journal and Highlighting Your Scholarly and Creative Activity. I currently serve as Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Dairy Science I come here representing ADSA's journal ecosystem, namely Journal of Dairy Science and JDS Communications. I'd like to start this presentation today by sharing this picture um, that was uh, entitled Man with Ho and painted by Malay in 1862. I first saw this when I was in graduate school and um, after looking at it, it just reminded me of how hard we work as scientists, not only to conduct experiments, but to write them up into manuscript form. <clears throat> and it reminded me of just how much time and effort is involved in that process. Um, ultimately, as a, as a scientist, we need to find the right fit for a journal to actually show off all of the work and the accomplishments that we have. And this is really uh, the, main uh, the main aim of our talk today. So what are our specific objectives? Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is note uh, several sources for a lot of the material that I'm presenting here today. Um, but the first thing is uh, I would like to help authors select the right journal uh, for your publications. Uh, there's an excellent paper out there um, uh, published by Souter and Sarley entitled Selecting a Journal for Publication Criteria to Consider. And I've included the URL there. Secondly, I'd like to spend some time describing how you as a uh, junior scientist or even senior scientists describe the impact of your publications. Again, I've included some of the sources that I use to develop the material today. But the first thing you should consider in a journal title is what is uh, the scientific rigor of that journal? How do you evaluate the scientific rigor? Things that you can look at are the number of publications over the last several years, for example, the last five years, and look at the quality of the work that's actually in, that, in those articles. Do they adequately describe the objectives 
experimental design methods, uh, data analysis, and and the the discussion itself, the quality of the discussion itself. What are the technical quality of the tables and the figures of that journal title? Um, are references adequately listed? Um, do they take measures to ensure that no text duplication actually uh, lands up on the journal uh, in the journal publications or the journal pages. In the case of Journal of Dairy Science, each article goes through a process to uh, evaluate for text duplication uh, to ensure that um, that articles are original in text. Uh, do they have um, measures in place to avoid conflict of interest? Do they have guidelines for reporting of research? Is there transparency in the policies of that journal? This is uh, just a, uh, a figure of data that I selected out of uh, PubMed. And what it is, is a, a listing of the publications um, since uh, the mid 1960s of several journal titles. I've listed uh, the Journal of Dairy Science uh, uh, here on the top, and that's found in the, in the blue line, as well as several other journals, which are, uh, um, the names have been uh, coded differently, so so the names actually can't be specific names can't be identified. You can see Journal of Dairy Science. I mentioned the last five years, but I think it's really important just to look at you know what is the vibrancy of that journal? Is does it continue to grow? Is it publishing articles, or has the title maybe fallen um, fallen away and and not been active in actually publishing a lot of journals? And you can journal articles, and you can see uh, in this case there was uh, certainly one particular journal title, which really has, you know, maybe kind of dropped in the number of, of papers that it's been published. But um, this is a, an easy way to just see the vibrancy of the journal. It's evaluating a uh, number of journal articles published within the last several years. Uh, one of the things uh, you as a scientist may also see is you may get a number of uh, invitations to publish in that journal. Some of them are very legit from uh, very credible journals. Uh, but others are not. This is uh, just an email that uh, I received actually several months ago, but I think I almost get them uh, daily, as I'm sure many people in the audience also do. But uh, this was uh, an invitation to submit a paper to a special issue of that journal. So I think when you receive these invitations, you should really ask yourself, well, what's the source of of uh, this email and this request and what's their motive? Uh, to go back to our first slide, you know, we work really hard in preparing the material to submit to a journal. Is this the journal sending me this invitation, the one that I want to represent my hard work? There's no right and wrong answer for this. The person that makes this decision is uh, is the author, uh, as well as probably feedback from, from co-authors as well. Um, some of you, this is actually an excellent article published in the Scholarly Kitchen uh, a little while ago, just looking at some of these uh, newer journal models and many of them. And what, what I've listed here is uh, actually figures out of this uh, article that was published in the Scholarly Kitchen, um, reporting days from submission to publication. Uh, you can see that these journals under this newer model do publish extremely quickly and very rapidly. Um, so on average, you can see the days from submission to publication is roughly 40 to 50 days. Uh, in comparison, more traditional journals are usually greater than 100 days. And what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about what happens in these uh, 100 days and perhaps, you know, where uh, what what things are happening here to make this so rushed and rapid. So in the case of uh, Journal of Dairy Science, uh, this is actually every year the Journal of Dairy Science reports an editorial report. Um, and so what I've listed are this, um, the report that came out this past April, um, describing the statistics for 2021 publications in the Journal of Dairy Science. On average, our review time is uh, approximately 130 days. And our time to submit to impress averaged in 2021, 194 days. So what's happening during this time? 
Uh, one of the things uh, we really strive to do, and a common question I get is, uh, how quickly will I receive word on uh, my publication? I can tell you the Journal of Dairy Science, we strive for that decision to be made in about 35 days. So what happens in those 35 days? Well, a paper is uh, submitted to the journal in uh, the Scholarly One website, and uh, it appears in the senior editor's uh, inbox. That senior editor is expected to assign a handling editor or a section editor uh, that paper within a couple days. And then that handling editor is responsible for identifying um, um, acceptable individuals that are experts in uh, a particular component of that manuscript. And uh, reviewers are selected usually within a week. It's important to understand that this decision is actually made at the section editor level, who is a scientist themselves. They may uh, usually are uh, an expert in that area. Uh, very, very rarely do we have a paper that's assigned to an editor uh, who um, maybe isn't in that area of expertise. Uh, so almost always, uh, this section editor actually identifies peer reviewers within a week. Those two to three uh, reviewers are identified, and then it's expected that the reviews come back within, a, within about uh, 14 days, and then the uh, section editor or handling editor has about a week to evaluate those reviews and ultimately, um, ultimately inform the authors of that decision. As I mentioned, uh, we strive for about 35 days. Recently pulled up some statistics on our 2022 uh, publish, uh, publication year, and we're averaging about 34.8 days for time to first decision. So we're very close to uh, what, what, we, what our kind of goals are for the journal. So what happens, as I mentioned, um, average time in review is about 130 days. And so what's happening after the, uh, the author receives the decision? Well, the author has the opportunity, some uh, usually, to revise a manuscript, or obviously if the, uh, if the manuscript is rejected, uh, this process doesn't continue. But if they have the opportunity to, to revise the manuscript, uh, that's done and it's resubmitted and then sent to uh, reviewers that complete a review and then the section editor will make a subsequent decision. Um, occasionally, uh, it'll go through a third, third review as well. What else should you look for? in a journal title. I think it's important to look at just the editorial quality of that publication. Um, ask yourselves, what is the editorial oversight and the reviewer commitment? What kind of things can you do uh, to evaluate the quality of that oversight? Uh, pretty simply, you can just look at the technicalities of that paper, of that paper, or that journal issue. You know, are there misspellings? Are there grammatical errors, uh, punctuation? Uh, is there a lack of uh, cohesiveness in the writing? Um, often a way to uh, just kind of rapidly scan a journal is to look at the table of contents uh, and look at the titles for some of these things, misspelling or, or grammatical errors. Also, uh, you can click on the abstract and that's a usually a fairly rapid way to evaluate the editorial quality of that journal. Uh, Additionally, uh, many journals are providing, good journals are providing PDF enhancements. Uh, and so in the case of, uh, of this journal article, what I've done is just highlighted a couple things. The first thing is uh, something I'll talk about a, a little later, but the ORC ID is available in the PDF. And this is a unique identifier for that individual author um, as well. There's links to the uh, digital object identifier within the reference section. The other thing you could look at are just overall journal operations. This may be a little harder to find, but these people are extremely important to the quality of the journal. What I have listed here on the right-hand side is uh, kind of a dated picture, I apologize, of our publication teams for JDS and JDSC. These are really important individuals that are 
versed in not only scientific publication, but are uh, well experienced in dairy science publication. So when uh, these individuals see terminology, they ensure that uh, it is correctly conveyed in the journal for the audience of dairy science. These people are responsible for adhering to uh, the publication schedule and then actually act as uh, contact information for the journal as well. Many of you, when you work in Scholar One, which is used to submit your article, you may have some interaction or emails uh, from Shauna Miller, which is uh, she's found here on the left hand side in the front row of this picture. So these are professionals that are always uh, managing simple journal operations. I shouldn't say simple, they're, they're complicated and busy. Sometimes they're short and uh, simple as well. Okay, uh, the other thing that's important to understand is what is the peer review process of that journal? Um, does that journal ascribe to transparency, which is really the benchmark of that journal? Is the peer review process clear? Uh, is there a disclosure of that process? In the case of JDS and JDSC, this is all listed in our instructions to authors policy document. Um, and so things that should be included here is the criteria of the peer review, selection of the reviewers, the type of reviews uh, that happened and uh, expected timeframes, as well as how the process uh, is actually handled. Um, other things that, that should be included in here is a discussion of conflicts of interest and confidentiality of the peer reviewers. The other thing that um, should be clearly listed uh, for a high quality journal is ethics. Um, journals are uh, should have clear expectations on how they handle plagiarism, how they handle conflicts of interest, um, how the um, um, how determination of human subject research is uh, is claimed and managed within the research institution, as well as the animal research in the terms of uh, IACOC committees, uh, confidentiality. Um, um, uh, description of uh, of things such as ghost authorship not being allowed. What is a ghost author? A ghost author is somebody that may write a paper but not appear on um, on the author line. Uh, also, policies related to data and image manipulation should also be uh, ascribed to by the journal. Um, one of the things that uh, both JDSD and JDS have is something called credit taxonomy. What I have is a screenshot just of Scholar One, where the name of each author is listed and then their contribution is actually uh, described by the submitting author. And so in the case of, of, of these authors, uh, you're able to determine whether the author had contributed to conceptualization, data curation, analysis, funding acquisition, uh, investigation methodology, and, uh, and project administration, um, as well as the contributor role um, is also listed here. Uh, resources, software, supervision, validation, visualization, writing of the original draft, and writing and editing. And then the uh, contribution can also be uh, further detailed, whether it was an equal contribution or whether that individual led or supported that specific role. mark of a high quality journal is obviously the people that are associated with that journal. And uh, in the case of uh, JDS and JDSC, we're really proud to have leading scientists who actively participate in our editorial board. These are individuals that have been identified as expertise in their field. Uh, they are all major influencers in the direction and the aim and the scope of the journal because they're active in the community of, of our journals. The affiliations of these individuals should also be uh, listed. And then journals should also have communications from the editor-in-chief. It's not just a dark journal that doesn't have uh, any communications from the leaders. And so today's webinar is an example of that, um, as well as the editorial report that we publish every year is also an example of communications from the editor-in-chief. 
Uh, another thing I would suggest looking at is just uh, just finding out the, what the reputation and the business model is of that journal. What exactly, uh, how exactly can you do that? You know, you can ask other colleagues about that journal, their experience with the journal, what they see, you, maybe what other uh, their coll uh, colleagues think of the journal. Uh, it's important to uh, maybe ask what the sponsoring society and the mission is in the case of uh, of our journals. It's the American Dairy Science Association or ADSA. Uh, the aims and the scope of that journal should be clear. And then the other thing is the fee structure should be clear. Is it uh, a journal that's just going to uh, take your paper and then issue um, a high cost for publishing it sometime after it's been accepted, or are the um, are the fee structures very clear um, upon submission of your journal? And in our case, all of those things are listed in the instructions to authors. <clears throat> um, another thing to consider is uh, just what the author's rights are and the copyright issues related to a paper published in that particular journal. Um, there's a number of uh, different uh, institutions that have to, uh, and, and funding agencies that have to abide by public ask, uh, um, access mandates. And uh, you may choose to reuse figures or tables or posting work in a repository. These are all, there's many different exceptions related to uh, JDS and JDSC. I don't have time to go through all of these uh, details. Um, but these are all listed on our website and the URL can be found here for uh, many of the most common questions. And if you see uh, your, your question not listed there, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide you information on what your rights are related to the copyright of a paper published in, in our journals. Another thing uh, you may want to consider is uh, the indexing status of that particular journal. Um, there's a number of different organizations that will index uh, papers. I've got uh, the logos of some of those listed here, PubMed, uh, Clairvayet, Web of Science, and Medline. Um, other things you may want to consider is, uh, you know, guest editors, the use of guest editors. Are these guest editors uh, experts in that field? Um, these indexing services, when they actually go to index um, index a journal, they are looking at the things that, that we've listed here and many of the things that we've already discussed. Do those journals um, uh, require authors to list conflict of interest policy, ethical statements, for, for instance, that an uh, IACOC uh, protocol was approved before the study was conducted? Um, do they properly state uh, uh, citations? Uh, the editorial board, is that listed? Um, citation analysis of, of the authors, grant support details, timelines, and peer review statements. These are all characteristics that these indexing services are looking for. Another thing you may want to consider is the impact factor. Uh, JDS uh, is uh, particularly proud of uh, a growing impact factor. Uh, over the last several years, currently our journal sits at about 4.22. Um, this is, uh, so what is an index, uh, uh, the impact factor? Essentially, uh, it was developed in the 1860 or 1960s, excuse me, for uh, helping individuals um, uh, describe the actual impact of that particular title. Um, I would uh, encourage you as you look at journals is uh, that you, not only just look at a high impact factor, but you uh, you place uh, some consideration on the relevance and the scientific rigor of that journal. So an impact factor can be uh, a useful metric, but it isn't the only metric uh, that you should consider. Ultimately, what you wanna do is get your work out there so people can word read it, and then um, hopefully cite it as well. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the um, providing you maybe some uh, suggestions and advice on how you can further uh, establish your name and the, your presence as a scientist through publication. Um, there's a number of, uh, of, of places that you can go and actually register yourself or make yourself known to uh, specific organizations so your information and your work can actually be tracked 
uh, through the global arena. Uh, probably one of the most uh, 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 visible ones is something called the ORC ID, which stands for Open Research and Contributor ID. It's a very simple identifier. You're just given a code. Um, and then what this allows uh, this organization do, to do is to track your information and your affiliation as it gets published. Uh, the Journal of Dairy Science does um, expect authors to have an ORC ID. So if you're submitting to the Journal of Dairy Science, I'd strongly consider that you go to the website and uh, acquire your ORC ID. It's free of charge uh, and it's used essentially just to track. Okay, there's a number of other places you can go to essentially register yourself as a scientist, which will help uh, many of these tracking, uh, tracking programs to properly identify and provide uh, you your credit for your work. I've got these listed here, um, the Claire Bayette Web of Science, Semantic Scholar, Google Scholar, and Scopus are just uh, some other, uh, uh, other important uh, websites that you can uh, you can go to and register yourself. So what I've done here is uh, once you've established uh, an ORC ID, um, um, you can go to some of these sites and actually evaluate uh, the impact or influence of some of your work or perhaps work of other people you're interested in following. So what I've actually done here is gone to the web of science and uh, pulled out uh, two authors that I know of. One is an early career scientist and one is an advanced career, very accomplished scientist on the right-hand side. So what kind of things can you look at in order to demonstrate your influence and impact of your work? Well, you can see, and I blocked out uh, the author's name, so you're not able to see those. But uh, if you go to Web of Science, not all of you will have access to Web of Science, but many of you will, uh, will be able to have access uh, to this portal through your university library. Um, but what things can you be looking at? Um, you can look at the number of publications and you can report the number of publications that um, are, are listed in the Web of Science for yourself. Uh, you can also list the number of citing articles. And so you can see this individual has published 38 articles and um, their article has been, these are, their articles have been cited a total of 311 times or without self citations, uh, 293 times. Uh, an average uh, citation per article for this uh, uh, early career scientist is 9.53 citations per item. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about the H index, but uh, for this scientist, uh, their H index is 10. If we compare this to an advanced career, and this doesn't happen overnight, but you can see this advanced sci uh, career scientist has 308 publications, over 5,000 of them, uh, over 5,000 citations on these papers, and an average of 36 citations per item. The H index of this scientist is, is higher than the early career scientist, and that's at 55. Uh, within the web of science, you can also look at uh, a number of figures. Uh, this is a figure, again, same slide set up here. We have an early career scientist and then the advanced career scientist on the right-hand side. And uh, what's illustrated here is uh, the number of publications over time number of publications are represented in bar graphs, as well as the number of citations in, uh, in this blue line. You can see, as I mentioned, uh, you don't build your research career overnight. You can see how this scientist has uh, developed their career, as well as the early career scientist who's been uh, publishing since uh, 1964. So obviously, uh, time is one reason why this scientist on the right-hand side has been uh, cited in greater numbers than the early career scientists. Other numbers that you can look at, this is again from the Web of Science, which is a listing of the individual journal title, and then listing the uh, citations over time. And uh, so this can be uh, a useful metric if you're just trying to understand the and describe the impact of, of, of your title. Um, in, in total, this title number one had been 
uh, cited 115 times. And you're able to click on uh, this number and then dig deeper and find the article that, that's citing this as well. Um, again, no, no surprise here that advanced career scientists had um, um, one paper that was cited uh, 509 times. So what is an H index? Um, really without going through all of the details on the calculation, most simply, it's an estimate of the importance and significance or broad impact of that individual scientist through their work that they've published. It can be found on uh, Web of Science, Google Scholar, and Scopus. If you're interested in understanding uh, the exact details of what an H index is, you can go to the paper, which I've listed here, which was published in PNS in uh, 2005. So you can imagine as for any index, there's some strengths and weaknesses of this. I've actually pulled this information from the uh, Bernard and Beckard Medical uh, Library website. And uh, what they've done is they've listed some of these strengths and weaknesses. So what are these strengths? Obviously it's, it's a metric that can be used for evaluating the commutative impact. So the impact totally of that career, that individual that's, that's been published. It does correct for a disproportionate weight of highly cited publications or publications that haven't been cited. Um, several resources uh, are used to calculate uh, the H index. And uh, as you've already seen as part of citation reports for authors. So what are some weaknesses? Uh, the reality is it's not intended for a specific time frame. It is really that, that scientist's career. And we all know uh, for all of us, whether it's uh, for pre professional reasons or, or personal reasons, uh, our publication may go through ebbs and flows. And so you're not able to let's just look at very specific time frames of, of that individual or report time frames of yourself. Um, it also is insensitive to publications that are rarely cited, such as meeting abstracts, publications that are frequently cited as reviews. Um, um, the other issue is, uh, as I've mentioned with the ORC ID, sometimes there can be issues with properly identifying that author's name uh, with that particular publication. The way obviously you can ensure or do your best to ensure that uh, you that that your name is properly associated with that work is to go out and uh, and uh, and find yourself and get yourself assigned an ORC ID so you properly are credited credited. Uh, the other issue or weaknesses is uh, the context of the citation. So uh, there can be some papers that are cited for reasons other than having uh, a positive impact in that uh, community. And so the context is not included. It is just a count of citations. Um, the other thing that um, is considered as a disadvantage is, is that young investigators are clearly at a disadvantage and academic disciplines also vary with the number of publications, references, and citations. And so um, it's really hard. In fact, it's recommended that you don't compare H indexes uh, across disciplines. It's really discipline specific. Self citations can also skew the H index. And then the H index also disregards author rank and co author characteristics on the publication itself. Uh, there's also a number of, uh, I guess, what we would call alternative metrics. What I have is a screen grab of a paper in the Journal of Dairy Science. And uh, if you go to Journal of Dairy Science, you'll see on the right hand side of each journal article is something called PlumX metrics. And uh, what this can do, if you click on that, this can actually provide uh, maybe a different, um, um, a different view of the impact uh, of your work. And so what is that? Uh, in the case of uh, social media, it'll actually show how many times that journal article actually um, actually had been tweeted. It'll show a count of uh, the number of readers as well as the number of, of saves in, in uh, of that journal article. So uh, some of this you may find useful. It also actually lists the very specific uh, tweet of, of that journal article. So again, this is maybe uh, a little, uh, uh, just an alternative way uh, to uh, show some of the impact and influence of that 
of that journal article. So what would be some uh, good advice uh, to increase the visibility of your work? You're probably tired of uh, me saying it, but you know, finding an ORC ID, okay. The other recommendation is to publish an open access journal. So if people are able to access your work, they're more likely to cite it. That should uh, improve many of the metrics that we've talked about. It's important to give publications a very clear and concise title. Uh, it's important to provide uh, important keywords in the abstract. These are all things that are used by uh, uh, many of the uh, search engines out there used to uh, help people identify papers to read and then eventually uh, consider for, for citing. It's also important that you share your research through mechanisms other than just journal articles, uh, giving uh, conference presentations, sharing your research data with, with other scientists in your field, and uh, mentoring others as well, finding a mentor uh, and mentoring other people. Uh, another thing that can be important to increase the visibility of your work is to be presenting seminars related to your research to groups, not only within your field, but also outside your field. This may include people like policymakers, healthcare providers, and consumers. I'd like to maybe just remark on um, what I think publishing shouldn't be. Um, publishing shouldn't be mysterious or impenetrable or intimidating unhelpful, disrespectful, unfair and onerous and uh, a good journal uh, and editors will ensure that these things don't creep in to the process that you're experiencing when you submit to a journal. So maybe more positively, what should publishing in a journal uh, be like? Well, it should be fair. Um, it should include quality decisions and feedback from those expert reviewers as well as the editors often. Uh, your uh, your uh, communications should be very timely. Um, it should involve um, very um, clear and honest reception of your science and structure uh, of you as an individual scientist or group of scientists uh, submitting papers. Uh, it should include accommodations during that process. Uh, it should also provide you with a feel of belonging to a, a larger community. Uh, in the case of JDS and JDFC, uh, a very clear uh, important area of our community is ADSA and uh, one place that we really have face-to-face -face, uh, interaction within that community is in our annual meeting. This is just a quick shout out to our annual meeting. It's an awesome place. If you haven't been to our annual meeting, I'd strongly encourage you to consider coming this June 25th to 28th. Uh, our meeting will be held in Ottawa, Ontario. It'll be a place where we're uh, exchanging uh, scientific information, whether it's through uh, posters or formal presentations, but you'll also have a uh, an opportunity to formally uh, interact with other individuals and network with other individuals that have uh, similar interests as yours, most, uh, most notably dairy science. So with that, that's actually the end of my presentation, but I just would like to consider a couple things in summary. Um, what are some journal uh, considerations when you're selecting a title? Well, you should find a journal that um, has scientific rigor, that has timely communications and publishing schedules, has high editorial quality and is ethical, uh, a journal that has a strong reputation in the field with a transparent uh, business model and is truly an impactful journal with an impactful information that uh, moves the science forward. Specifically, um, how do you describe the impact and influence of your publications? Some of the things that we mentioned today is to describe the number of publications that you have, the number of co-authors, the citations of those work, the uh, overall H index associated with your name, and as well as maybe some informal uh, things like the Plum Metrics mentions through Twitter as well. So that's the end of my presentation today. Um, I really appreciate everybody taking the opportunity to join us. Uh, and I look forward to hearing feedback and answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you so much, Paul. We're gonna go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of the event, as Paul had mentioned. All right, so first question is, would JDS consider receiving opinion papers in the future? So the question is, um, will we receive opinion papers? And, and so currently, right now, we don't have a paper type for opinion. However, in uh, 2023, we do have uh, maybe a somewhat similar uh, paper type, and that's called a perspective. Uh, if you want more information on that, I would suggest you go to the 2023 Instructions to Authors. Those papers are short papers, and they're invited papers from the journal that really discuss uh, an emerging area of science where the authors are provided an opportunity to talk about some of the scientific background, and then you talk about where they envision the, the trajectory of that science going. As I mentioned, this, this paper type is by invitation only, but uh, we're always interested in hearing ideas and we're actively pursuing people for potential ideas. And so um, if you've got an idea um, that, that may fit in this paper type, and as I said, you can find this on the instructions to authors, don't hesitate uh, to drop me a note and I'd be happy to uh, visit with you about it. Great, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, other yeah. questions? Yeah, we've got quite a few, I'll keep us moving. All right, yeah. what options are available for authors from low-income countries who cannot afford to pay for open access and are not members of JDS or ADSA? Yeah, so, um, so um, you're right. Uh, certainly emerging countries uh, have struggles. They do have struggles in paying page charges. And if there's a concern with your, page, your paper that's been accepted, um, First of all, I, I would uh, suggest that you reach out and uh, look at the ADSA website at the cost of membership. And uh, the cost of membership is, uh, I think, quite reasonable. And then you do get a significant reduced page charge uh, when you are a member. If uh, you're in a very special circumstance, you can certainly reach out to us and uh, we will consider uh, your request on a case-by-case -case basis. Great, thank you so much. Next question, is ResearchGate credible for the H-Index score? I'd love to hear your yeah. comments. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, is, is ResearchGate a credible source for the H-Index? Um, I'll be honest uh, with you, Mohammed. I look personally at uh, the web of science, um, but I know there's several, and I mentioned uh, several um, other sources that post the H-Index. Uh, ResearchGate does also post that. What I can't tell you is what goes into ResearchGate's uh, numbers. I assume it's very similar to the station that I gave you, if not identical. But I think the other thing uh, you should be mindful of is I don't actually know the the schedule of updating those numbers. And so um, um, I don't know in the case of ResearchGate, actually. Another place you can go is uh, Scopus, and I believe you can type in the author name and uh, for if you're able to look at that that uh, H index, and I know that that schedule and uh, calculation uh, aligns with uh, Web of Science. Great. All right. And do you recommend sending all of your own manuscripts to a so small set of journals? Is there any disadvantage to publishing in a different journal for each new mm -hmm. manuscript? Yeah, that's a good question. So where do you send your manuscripts? Do you go to a single journal or do you consider other journals? Um, there isn't a set answer for that. I really think it depends on you as an author. Um, I do know, you know, when you start working and, uh, and uh, collaborating with a group of, of scientists and not only collaborating, but just part of the community of scientists, a lot of people do, uh, focus on one or several journals. And there's a couple advantages to that. One of the advantages is yet that you know what that journal is looking for technically in terms of structure, uh, in terms of if, how the paper is, uh, is, is uh, included into the manuscript. But um, there's not a set answer. I would really uh, suggest you, you look at the journal and say, well, is this the place I'm comfortable with? Is this the place that um, I want to 
share my information. And then the, the, I guess the last thing is if you do select one or a small group of journals, what you do is you start to establish your name within that community. So I would, I would suggest that there is an advantage um, uh, focusing on a journal, but it certainly, uh, there's no hard and fast rule and that's really something for you to decide. But I, I like the question. All right. And is there any web source to find suitable journals based on keywords? Ah, oh, that's a good question. So you're interested in uh, paper or uh, journal titles. Um, that's a really good question. I think on the web of science, you're able to include keywords and bring up paper uh, journal titles. But I have to admit, uh, this question got me kind of flat-footed, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I should mention this is maybe a good opportunity. We are logging all the questions. And so, uh, Jess, when we do post this webinar, we will include answers to all the questions. So, so the answer for that question will probably have to wait to be most accurate. Absolutely. We'll get back to you on that one. Thank you for the question, though. All right. Next question. Could you speak to the rationale behind extra requirements for submission? Things like visual abstracts, highlights, etc. It seems that journals are continuously asking for more and more items beyond the actual article. There, yeah. These are just one more thing before getting the manuscript submitted and it is unclear of the value of creating these items. Yeah, I like that question. Um, you're right. I remember when I started in my career, you could probably have a, a paper submitted to uh, the journal within five minutes. And, and that's changed for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is so if we just take, for example, um, the interpretive summary, uh, Jess, this may be a good opportunity to talk about what that interpretive summary is. Uh, that was designed really to provide authors an opportunity to give us a, a very layman's layperson's description of the work and the implications. And uh, Jess, actually, as she's uh, involved in the social media promotion of our journal, that's one place that Jess is going to find information to highlight articles. And then there's other people, you know, just casual readers uh, of of the journal that may find that useful. So that's one ad. Um, another one, as I I mentioned, is uh, is a description of author contribution. Uh, that's fairly new and I know there's a lot of boxes to check, especially if you have a, a lot of uh, authors. Um, and really that's that's really uh, to improve uh, the transparency um, and uh, to ensure proper ethics for the authors. And so um, I talked about some of these indexing services and many of these indexing services are actually requiring additional information for the authors to submit. So um, the author um, the author contributions is an example of that. So I, I know it's it's added work. Uh, I can tell you that when we look at uh, what has to be added, we don't do we don't make that decision lightly. We know that it requires work and it makes it more onerous. Um, and so there is good reason behind those. If there's other specific questions related to uh, another item that I haven't mentioned about, don't hesitate to drop it here in the, the chat box. Uh, but but those are really the, the main reasons. And I'll also say, um, as right now, as far as on our radar screen, there's no additions uh, that will be made to what's required in the submission of AD, either JDS or JDSC. So I hope uh, what you see is what you get for a very long time. But Good question. I feel the same pain you do sometimes as a submitting author. But I just wanted to tack on that, at least for JDS and JDSC, we take a, you know, a, a lot of effort to help promote the work once it's out in the world. So those interpretive summaries and visual abstracts, especially for me, someone who's helping to promote, are quite helpful. If I can just plug that, that it's mm -hmm. helpful to get your research out yeah. there once it's actually been accepted. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that mm -hmm. question. All right, next up. What is the acceptance rate of JDS? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so um, we are just looking. So um, in the presentation, I did include um, a citation for the 2021 editorial report. And so uh, you can go and find that online. And in table one, 
there is a listing of the acceptance rates for um, 2021 all the way going back to 2017. Uh, we're bumping right around 50 percent. Um, and uh, I don't have the 2022 statistics um, compiled quite yet, but that's what we're at is about 50, 55 percent. Are there any special considerations you'd give to postgraduate students when it comes to publishing charges? Uh, so, you know, all contributing authors, uh, you know, if they're a member, they get the the identical rate as as all other members. So there aren't any uh, any uh, changes to those rates. I, I will just mention, uh, you know, and just a shout out to the ADSA board who does actually provide uh, an offset or support. Of, of, of our current page charges. And so um, I think our page charges are very reasonable, especially when you compare us to other open, open access titles. Great. All right. Um, is the Journal of Dairy Science interested by all animal species producing milk and dairy products or focusing in cattle dairy research only? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that question, especially, you know, when I saw the countries that are represented here, we've got an awesome, uh, an awesome country or an awesome participation from around the world. And uh, I will say that uh, JDS and JDSC both, uh, they do focus on uh, milk that's produced for human consumption. And so you don't see a lot of work on, for instance, um, uh, um, milk production in mice or rats, but we do focus on really all species that produce milk for human consumption. So small ruminants, although uh, we publish less so than, than cattle, um, small ruminants are certainly part of our community. So I'm glad you asked that question, especially given our participation today. Great. And I love this question. Next up is how can I become a member of ADSA? Yeah, so membership, um, I'll just shout out a couple of the benefits of membership and then mention how you can be, uh, how you can become a member. I think uh, in the chat, we'll be including a URL uh, or a website address to become a member. That's where you go. But, you know, a couple advantages, um, obviously I've mentioned reduced page charges for uh, JDS and JDSC. Uh, you have access to something called SPAC, and SPAC is basically uh, a repository for uh, proceedings at um, dairy meetings around the world. Uh, so, for instance, uh, not that long ago, I was at uh, a meeting in the Northeast, and I know the proceedings at that meeting will show up in, at SPAC. Uh, you have reduced registration costs for the annual meeting. Uh, you have access to the membership directory. And I know in this day and age, it's easy to find people. The cool thing about the membership directory is that it tends to be quite accurate and you get, uh, you know, phone numbers, uh, whatever whatever people want to share as far as their information and contact information in the membership. You also have an opportunity to, um, to uh, participate in the award nomination and then receive awards. And then you get to document uh, on your CV that you're a part of uh, the G, uh, the ADSA community. So I know that seems staged, but uh, it, it uh, great question. Go to the website and uh, I think you'll see great benefits to being a member of ADSA. All right, a couple questions for our last few minutes today. What is JDS's policy on data for the manuscript being submitted? Mm -hmm. So um, I know there's a number of granting agencies that you know require data to be made available. We do not, uh, JDS or JDSC, we do not have a repository that holds data and uh, it's not required by either journal to make data available to the authors. However, author or to, to the reader. However, I should note that authors can make it available by including a link to uh, an external website that can include some supplementary material. But um, uh, submission of the data is not required by either journal. And emphasis has not been placed on camel dairy and research. Yeah, yeah. Um, could you speak to that? And yeah. Yeah, yeah. the comment was that there's nutritious milk from, from camels. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, we don't publish a lot of papers on uh, camel milk and camel milk is indeed uh, nutritionist, nutritious. Um, I'd have to dig, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are some papers and certainly they would be, uh, they would be fairly considered if papers are uh, submitted to the Journal of Dairy Science related to camel papers, uh, even donkey milk. I know we published some of that in the past. So certainly um, we don't want to miss the importance of, of, of uh, nutritious camel milk. And certainly we'd consider those papers. Thank you so much. And I see that there was a couple of questions dropped in the chat. So I'm going to try and sneak those in really quick in our last couple of minutes. So one of them is, how does JDS deal with articles submitted by early career researchers? Does it consider mm -hmm. reputation of the submitting authors for those articles being submitted? Yeah, yeah. So good question. Um, I talked a little bit about early career scientists uh, and, you know, just, just the road that they've got to travel. Um, in granting agencies, when you submit a grant to some agencies, you are actually given on a scorecard some points if you're an early career scientist. Uh, in the publishing world and in the case of, of BS and JDSC, um, you don't have an official scorecard like that. And so um, that's actually not officially considered. And when the work is submitted, the work in and of itself is con considered. And there isn't a scorecard or anything placed on uh, the, the stage of the author's or the corresponding author's career. So good question. All right, we have a couple more questions that went unanswered. So sorry about that, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time today. So I'm gonna move us on to our closing remarks. And again, I just wanted to remind everyone, today's webinar recording as well as the deck and some unanswered questions will be emailed out to everyone who is in attendance today and posted to the ADSA webinars page as well. All right. Thank you again to Paul Kononoff and all of our attendees today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, in the meantime, you can visit the ADS site, ADSA site to learn more about our journals, sign up for new issue alerts that come directly to your inbox, volunteer to be a reviewer if you feel called to do so, and submit your manuscript, of course. I'm going to drop a bunch of links in the chat for everyone to help you do that. All right. Um, as Paul mentioned, we also host an annual meeting, which is coming up this June. I did just drop that link in the chat for you. It's an amazing chance to put your research in front of the most important people and your peers in the dairy sciences space. So we'd love to see you there. Um, ADSA also has a weekly newsletter called Dairy News. So be sure to sign up to be the first to know about other events we're hosting, the latest industry news we think you should have on your radar, and just any of the latest items directly from ADSA. Again, all those links are in the chat for you. We'll have the recording out to everyone shortly. Thank you again to Paul and to everyone who joined us today. Thanks for joining us, everyone.